Latino Rebels as La Plebe plays in the back. Venas Abiertas, one of our favorite, favorite songs. It is Sunday night, 10 p.m. on the East Coast, live. 7 p.m. on the West Coast, 9 p.m. Central Time. And yeah, it's also uh, 8 p.m. Mountain Time. We do have some Mountain Time listeners, and I don't even know what time it is in Arizona. I think it's like 6 or 8 or whatever, or 8.30 or... And I think it's like 10:30 in Caracas, but I don't. That's when I start losing all my, all my sense of time zones. Um, but anyway, this is Latino Rebels Radio. Um, you can follow us at latinorebels.com, at Latino Rebels on Twitter. Hey, can you we me are me? also on Facebook at Latino Rebels. Here, we here, here. are, we are on on Pinterest, Tumblr. Just follow us on Latino Rebels. Julio Ricardo Varela. I can't even say my name, but I'm so excited about today's show because we have some two powerhouse shows uh, talking about episodes. Um, we're going to be talking about the upcoming documentary, Ruben Salazar, Man in the Middle, which will be on PBS, I believe, starting this Tuesday night. And then we're going to part three of Al Jazeera America's Borderland. Part three just finished. They went on La Bestia. And we'll be talking about that as well. Throughout the show, if you want to tweet us at Latino Rebels on Twitter, you can also call us at 347-308-8633. That's 347-308-8633. Uh, call in if you have any questions you want to talk to us or tweet us. We'll try to get the tweets on. We're ready to go. Before we bring in the director of Ruben Salazar, Man in the Middle, we got El Profesor Luis Marentes with me. Profesor, ¿qué tal? ¿Qué pasó, Ricardo? How are you? I am good. Julio, Ricardo. <laughs> That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's Sunday night, right? It's Sunday night. Um, yes. I before we get into watching Borderland, you just got back from watching Borderland. I, I'm gonna, I'm yes. gonna, we're gonna talk about part three um, very soon. But we're gonna, we are gonna be talking about Ruben Salazar, PBS documentary with, with, with the director in a couple minutes. But Luis, but. Um, before we start, then, um, how are you feeling tonight? How are you feeling tonight? Just what's what's on your mind? Like what what has been hitting you the last couple of days? Well, to tell you the truth, you called me a professor. The semester is about to finish for us. I, my students are finishing their classes, which is a, a big change. But I am really, I am really impressed by what's going on in that borderland. I've been watching it. Uh, and I'm excited about that show too. Oh, you guys! So we're going to talk Borderland after, and uh, we'll get Monica, and you'll you'll stay on. We'll talk with some of the cast members, but first we're going to switch gears because we're actually going to be talking about an upcoming documentary that will be on PBS this Tuesday night. Check local listings. Um, it is called Ruben Salazar, Man in the Middle, and it is about the life of. Renowned Chicano journalist Ruben Salazar, and we're very excited to have the director of the documentary with us, um, and that would be Philip. Uh, Philip Rodriguez, are you there? I'm here. Awesome, awesome. Um, and you are calling from from the West Coast, right? Los Angeles, to be exact. From LA, from Los Angeles. So, Philip, before we get into the, sh the documentary, you're here with uh, myself, Julio Ricardo Varela. Julito and uh, Luis Marentes, and we're going to be asking a couple of questions. But before we get into the documentary, why don't you let our listeners tell, you know, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what you do, what, you know, just just feel free to, to share uh, who you are. Sure, man. I'm a filmmaker and uh, from L.A. Uh, my grandparents were all born in Mexico, and uh, I was, I was uh, my, my folks, uh, what, Jesus, what, what am I talking about? Were I baptized? I, I, you know, I, I was baptized. <laughs> Well, you know, you have and to say when you're baptized because, you know, if you're Latino, where were you baptized? That's, that's what I don't remember. And, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just like, very excited about the project we just completed. It's going to be on the air soon. There's a lot of buzz, and I think it's a very strong, uh, a very strong, distinct experience. And, uh, yeah, so and we're thanks really, a lot for the opportunity. No, it's great. And, you know, I caught it over the weekend. I was um, blessed that the, that the good people that produced this and you guys allowed us to give a uh, – to, to view it, and um, I saw it yesterday. Um, first of all, I before we get into this, um, kudos. I, I I have to give you just tons of compliments, not only from a 
filmmaking perspective or storytelling perspective, but um, it was just really gripping. Like it was 50, you know, whatever, 50 plus minutes of just really interesting content. And you as a filmmaker, the person that directed it, um, it, you just cut to the chase and told the story. Um, And it just, the way you did it with the, the visuals and and the, and the interviews and wasn't a lot of voiceover. It didn't feel traditionally documentary type. Can you just talk a little bit about your technique as to how you yeah, approach I mean, the story? You know, I, I'm not a big believer in the voice of God thing where you have some, some white dude in a booth uh, telling <laughs> you how things should be. And, of course, you know, sometimes the network pushes for that because they want things clear and they want things in a way they feel they can have control. But ultimately, in, in, move, in stories like this, or in a lot of Latino things, there's no authority. We're still figuring it out. I mean, right. we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, we're trying to figure out which way we're going to go, who we're going to be. And to a large degree, I love the fact that it's kind of an open game and it's an open story. So I, I, I tend to like to use uh, voices of the people uh, who, who, who can tell me a variety of perspectives and create kind of a salon experience where you're all well, you're putting together people that are unlikely to be in the same room and then have them kind of go at it and figure out a story or figure out an analysis. And uh, I, just, I, I just prefer it. It means it feels more alive and less canned. And in this right. case, this story is so, this story was so deep and so rich. And it was just sitting there kind of wasted forever. And right. for 40 some years since Salazar's death. So the opportunity to pick up this story and to tell such a riveting story, you know, I have to be real stupid to, to mess this one up. <laughs> well, let's talk about the life of Ruben Salazar. And, and why don't you talk a little bit of what you want to share about his life and what, what attracted you to the project? Um, but, but maybe tell a little bit more about for our listeners, because to be honest with you, a couple of people in the group who saw it as well, and, and people that have been reading about it have like, they've never, you know, I've known about him, other people have known about him, and Luis will we'll talk, we'll take some questions after, but, but a lot of people didn't even know Ruben Salazar existed. And so if you can tell a little bit, you know, of our listeners why his story matters. Salazar was a, a mid-century American journalist. He was born in Juarez, uh, but raised in El Paso. Uh, and El Paso is an interesting place. Uh, uh, in, as, as early as the late 50s, they had a Mexican-American mayor. So in, in El Paso, it's kind of a they're, – they're already in the future. They're already, already a majority, right. and they're already asserting themselves on a political level, which many other places in the U.S. still hasn't done. So Salazar comes out of El Paso, goes to L.A., gets a job at the L.A. Times, and he looks around and he goes, my God. The Latinos are, are complete atrasados. They're backwards. They're, they're, mm-hmm. They have nothing. They have no power. They're beleaguered. They're downtrodden. And he, as an entitled kind of veteran of the Korean conflict, comes and says, this, this, this is strange. I'm not accustomed to this. So he begins to assert uh, his, his, his skills as a, as a reporter and a writer to, to explain uh, who Mexican-Americans are. And, uh, and he becomes the, the most important chronicler of the experience uh, that, any, that any major media had at that point. Uh, finally, he does a lot of interesting things, gets sent to Vietnam, Mexico City, Cuba, and other places where he gets a tail from the FBI, and mm-hmm. is then asked to come back to Los Angeles to report the Chicano movement. And the Chicano movement, he wasn't very impressed by at the beginning. He said, God, there's a bunch of kids, you know, playing revolution and things. Not it doesn't seem that interesting to me. I was in, you know, he says, I was in Vietnam. I saw Ho Chi Minh. And these dudes are, you know. But in any case, he begins to feel some kind of sympathy with, with some of the agendas of the, of the Chicano kids, and although he's older, and begins to write about them. He also writes about things like police abuse in Los Angeles. And in those days, Los Angeles, I mean, the police were just the boss. There was no challenging them. They were unrivaled in their power. And... They were rather brutal, and they were particularly brutal in, in minority communities. So he begins to write about that. He gets, some, he gets some blowback from law enforcement, and they say, you need to stop this. The chief calls him in. You've got to stop stirring up the Mexicans. They can't handle this. Well, about three months later, he ends up dead at the hands of a Los Angeles County sheriff. During, and that was during the, the infamous uh, Chicano moratorium, which is August 29th. 1970. Right. So, right. as a result, he's become a bit of an enigma, and, 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 and many Chicanos did not feel that the case was properly adjudicated and had felt for 40-some years since that this 
his death was a result of a conspiracy. So what I did, I said, I'm tired of speculation, and right. I'm tired of not knowing. And I think we as, as people deserve truth and not mythology. So I sued the county, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, the largest municipal police force in the country, for suicide records, for, for the homicide boxes. And with the, with the help of Mal Def, and we won the lawsuit. And right. with that incredible treasure trove of data, audio recordings, uh, photographs, sensitive documents, list of informants, we, uh, we assembled this movie. So it's a movie that could not have been made, basically, without the information. And it's without quite, you it's suing them. Precisely. And so it's a, it's a really <laughs> powerful film, man. And, uh, That's I'm very great. Proud of it. Um, no, it's really exciting. I mean, I, I, I saw it, and, and it just captured me. I want to talk about some additional themes as we go. But I, I want to bring in uh, Luis, um, Luis Manetes to talk a little bit. Luis, did you know about Salazar um, and, oh. and his story? Yes, yes. I was familiar with Salazar. I was familiar. I didn't know his, the long history that appears in the documentary, but I knew of him as it's presented in the documentary as that martyr figure who was killed by that right. tear gas shot during the Chicano moratorium. I am familiar with the moratorium, with the walkouts, with other important figures like Sal Castro, who died last year from, from the period. And what, what I was very curious about in this documentary that really caught my attention is the title itself, Man in the Middle. Right. Because you play with that docu in, the, in the documentary from beginning to end with this figure who was in the middle of the U.S. and Mexico, in the middle of, like you say, he was an entitled Mexican who comes to Los Angeles and for a while tries to fit into the Los Angeles time system, but he is growing all along. And I would love for you to explore with us that idea of why you chose that title, Man in the Middle, which is so well, important. I think that, um, let's see, the, the, the beginning, it's, it's very, well, the first thing is an abstraction, and that is the indeterminacy of Latinos in the racial binary system that the United States has had since its inception, where there's a black and there's a white, and there's no understanding of anything in between. And, of course, that's changing radically now where, as, our, as our demography changes. But the imagination of the establishment and what we should, I, I use an old-fashioned word, didn't I? But the imagination of the nation, by and large, is still locked in this idea we're a black and white country, and that's horseshit, and, and it hasn't been true for a long time. So mm -hmm. it, it, you can imagine the mid-50s and the 60s where Salazar is working. You know, uh, 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 let, let, so let, let, me, let me say this. The, the idea of the man in the middle is kind of an embodiment of, of Latinos at large in a system mm -hmm. that only sees black and white. Number one. Number two, he was a, he was a mid-century guy, like a Don Draper. I mean, think about that. He was playing out his 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 uh, double consciousness in, in 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 that part of the in that part of the century. He's as you said, he was a border boy. He he did have a double consciousness. He had a very strong sense of his Mexicanness. He had a strong sense of his privilege as a white Latino. He had he was married to a Weta, and he lived in a very white Republican enclave. He lived, County, County, was, he lived in Orange County. He lived in Orange County. Which was John, mm -hmm. was was John, John Wayne, Wayne, John Wayne, California. Thank you. And, uh, and you know, John Birch Society, et cetera. So, right. moreover, he was stuck because he was a, he was a silent generation uh, man. He wasn't a baby boomer. He wasn't a Chicano. Ultimately, no. He was a Mexican-American for the vast part of his life. And he was caught in the end in a crossfire between the Chicanos, the, the kids who were younger than him, and who were, more, who, who, who were impatient, who were not assimilationists, and between the cops. And, and he ended up dead as a result of that place that he was. He was, in the middle, he was in the middle in his life, and he was in the middle in his death. No, it's true. Oh, um, we're talking part? with director Philip Rodriguez of the PBS documentary, Ruben Salazar, Man in the Middle. Uh, that is coming out this week later on PBS. Check your local listings. And one of the, the themes that we're talking about is the title about uh, Salazar and how being in the middle is, is actually – Perhaps a very universal theme, and, and Philip, you talk about that as how Salazar's story really resonates even now, because it, what, what you were able to do and capture in about, you know, 50-plus minutes, which I'm still, you know, 
I'm so amazed as as a filmmaker that you were able to to bring these bigger themes to it. It's not just about Salazar's uh, death and what happened because you spend a lot of time there at the end. But what I was intrigued about is exactly what Luis was talking as well, but just how Salazar throughout his life was constantly living, quote unquote, in the middle and and mm-hmm. constantly becoming someone that, um, as much as he maybe might have. Um, at least what I think, well, the way I looked at the documentary, maybe might have resisted sort of, you know, going, coming from being, you know, he did resist going from Mexico City back to L.A., and he actually missed the 1968 student revolution stories that you guys mentioned. But the fact that he resisted this whole thing, and, and even being in the middle, he kind of moved back and forth in his life. And in the end, you know, I, I saw it as just what it is to be bilingual, bicultural, Latino in the United States, sort of the swinging pendulum. You know, it's like, where are you? Right? Where are you today? So um, it, going into that movie, was that something that you wanted to explore or was that something that came out of Salazar's story? Yes, absolutely. I mean, think, if you think it's like so many of the Chicano stories, a lot of, some of the Latino stories are kind of bathed in bathos and sentimentality. You think about the recent film about Cesar Chavez, and, you know, it's just kind of like a sacred uh, storytelling, kind of noble savages who are not in some way real. And I, I was very dissatisfied, the degree to which Salazar had been seen as a saint, as a martyr. And I definitely wanted to flesh him out. And I knew, fundamentally, because I was raised by a silent generation of mexican Americans, I knew that he was interesting. He was more interesting that, and, and more more complicated and more self-contradictory than right. the Chicanos wanted to make him out to be uh, as a martyr. They flattened him. So, yes, absolutely. I wanted to take on his, his identity as something incredibly complex and, 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 and be, be a useful metaphor for us as a people at large, and, and not in a negative way. You know, right. always as his death was emphasized, oh, he died, they killed him, we're victims, they're bad. You know, at some point, that doesn't get you anywhere. And mm. at some point, use, and, 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 and a lot of these, a lot of these Chicano metaphors became dead and static and useless, really. And so I say, let's go back at them again. Let's open them up again. And let's imbue them with humanity, with complexity, with brains, and with balls. And I think that's what we did in this film. That's great. So I'm bringing um, that you my- do. Yeah, can I go, go ahead? Can please. I just mention one thing? And the other thing that you do in these movies, you look at his private life, that tension between his father and his mother, and even his own marriage and his children. Precisely. I think that in the movie, as, and, and thank you for noting that, you know, Ruben, like a lot of us, is a, is a product of a certain kind of racial argument that predates the United States. You know, the, 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 the hatred of the Indian that exists on a certain level in Criollo, white, Latin American society. And his mother had a great deal of contempt for what she considered to be indolent, inferior Mexican types, and namely indigenous or mestizo types. And she really pushed Ruben to be white. The father, on the other hand, who was darker skinned and liked to drink every once in a while, uh, he was more sentimental about Mexico. And he said, you're Mexican. The gringos have no soul. So at a very early on, like a whole a lot of us, at least of a certain generation, there was a, there was a, there was a race war. There was a, a cultural conflict going on in his home. He didn't need the United States to teach him about racism. It already existed in the country where he came from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Mar- um, I want to bring in Marce, Mar- who's another Latino rebel who's been um, – Latino rebels who's been uh, listening as well. Marce, um, are you there? I think I am. Yeah, you are. Um, can you, do you have anything for Philip or any comments about the Salazar story? You want to ask him a question about since, you know, you are from the West Coast, you are from Southern California, um, you know, growing up on the, on the you know, on the I'm from Tijuana, let's put it From Tijuana, San Diego, you know, area. So um, do, do you have anything to add? You know, um, I'm really looking forward to this because I can really relate to what you said about um, – him being very Mexican and him being very much in the middle. So I'm really, really looking forward to this. Um, I mean, I grew up less than a mile, probably half a mile from, from the U S border um, in Tijuana. So I can really relate to this, like ni de aquí ni de allá type of thing. And, and, and <laughs> that could be the, the new title. 
Yeah, but, but it could be the new title for first... Philip. Although people and people, they might not get it at PBS. No, need that, need, no, need that, yeah. That's an uh, Indian Maria movie. But, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very common that we kind of bemoan the fact that we're of these two very distinct civilizations. Right. When, in fact, I see it in the life of Salazar, it was an advantage. You know, that he, he was more cosmopolitan. He was more interesting. He was bilingual. He had a double consciousness. He had more empathy for the civil rights black movement than many of his white colleagues did. So I feel like in, in Salazar's case, he's kind of instructive about this film is that he was badass, you know, and it was because yeah. that he was from, he was a, a, a border boy, that he was more interesting. He was not less. He was not, and certainly there were ambivalences and there were confusions, but ultimately there was more savvy and capacity. So once they send him off to Vietnam and to, you know, these faraway places, he's not tripping. He's not uncomfortable. Right. He is prepared for the other in a way that lots of monocultural people are not and I think it's very right. really important for us to remember the advantages we have culturally, that we are indeed more interesting, that we are indeed more cosmopolitan, that we are indeed richer than those who have only one story. Yeah. So, I just wanted to know that. Up, so to wrap it, I mean, but let's spend a little bit. Um, you talked about the fact that you had to sue um, <laughs> people to get more about Salazar's information. Can you, yeah. I know people are going to be talking about the documentary, you know, he, he did die um, on August 29th, uh, 1970, uh, during the Chicago Moratorium, and you guys bring a lot into the story, because what happens in the documentary is that it becomes sort of like from the biography of Salazar, and then it becomes, the last part of it becomes like a, you know, crime, crime-like documentary, which was really interesting shift, because it went from yeah, like... Life to like now let's try to do this solve it. So, what can you you know? I know people will be watching the documentary on PBS this week, but just talk about that. I mean, what what yeah, you learn sure. from it, what you think it's where it's going to go next, and why uh, why again this is such an important story for you. This is a long-standing mystery, and it's been really a wound, an open wound, in the Mexican American identity in 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 this part of the country at least and probably in, in a good part of it. Um, and I felt like it's, it, it, it was a festering wound. It's not, like, it's not a healthy thing on a body, and it's certainly not a healthy thing for people. And so that really was my agenda, to get to the bottom of it. And, and I think we did. And, um, and it's an, a fascinating uh, whodunit. It's a fascinating because he indeed was killed by a cop. No question about it. He died at the hands of a policeman. And the question has always been, was it a conspiracy? Was it on purpose? Had he been targeted? Moreover, he had been surveilled by the FBI, by Hoover's FBI, an extensive dossier following him in Mexico City, following him in Vietnam. And so this was an open question. And I think, mm -hmm. and I think we have satisfied and answered, and in that way created a healing over a story that had haunted my people, my Vasa, for, for a long time. Yeah, so, I'm, so extremely proud. Um, I'm extremely proud of you about the achievement. So why don't you t now, you know, why don't you tell people, you know, we're talking to uh, director Philip Rodriguez of Ruben Salazar, Man in the Middle, PBS documentary that's coming out this week. Philip, can you share where it's going to be on, you know, when, yeah. when's the premiere, you know, what people are saying. Yeah. Just go ahead and, 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 you know, push your movie for the next minute. Okay, go. man. <laughs> well, first of all, broadca broadcast premiere it's on PBS, all markets in the country, everywhere. And uh, it's 9 p.m. In, in certain places, and it's 8 p.m. in others. So please check your list. Tuesday, That's Tuesday night, April right? 29th. Tuesday night? Tuesday, April, April 29th. 29th. This coming Tuesday. The reviews right. so far have been stellar. Um, and I feel like I mean, we've won a couple prizes in film festivals already. And I think it's, and it's a really positive relief to some of the more sentimental, untrue stories that we've been offered and offering ourselves for the last in the last book. Last this last year, it's it's kind of a an adult to treat our people like adults and give us reality history, not horseshit history. That not you know, I, 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 having seen history. it this weekend, having seen it this weekend, um, and having been someone that um, believes in what you're saying, <laughs> in the yeah. lack of horse, um, yeah. I I do have to give you kudos for for telling a story that's real, that that has a feel to to the time. I mean, you really brought Los Angeles alive. You really brought 
even like El Paso and Mexico City and the 60s. And just this, you know, I am a journalist, I am a reporter, and I was, you know, I have been in news organizations where I am one of the only Latinos in the newsroom. So for me to see the story of Salazar and, and, you know, as a journalist and as a reporter, I go, wow, like there's always someone that comes before you. And I knew exactly, you know, I know exactly how he's feeling. So I just think it's a story that resonated with me personally and with a lot of our, 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 our listeners because you, you, you said it so well. It's like we're treating these stories, uh, you know, as adults. And these are real stories, and it's time to, to tell these stories uh, in a way that they, they deserve to be told. Thank you, man. And you so know, I want to thank you for doing it, man. That, you know, there's nothing wrong with machete or other stuff, with the fantastical stuff or nonsense stuff. There's nothing wrong with it. It's entertaining. But fundamentally, for us to grow collectively, for us to find our way and be stronger. Right. You know, right. like the Jews, they're engaged in their history now. I mean, let's dig into it. It's not a drag. It's actually incredibly compelling, incredibly interesting, and uh, right. enriching. So uh, please tune in. And the more success and more viewers we get to shows like this, the more we get to make and see ourselves in a, in a, in a better, more interesting way. Well, thank you so much. We were talking with Director Philip Rodriguez of PBS's Ruin Salazar, Man in the Middle. Philip, un placer. Thank you for joining us. We'll make sure a lot of people watch this for you. Thank Peace you out, so man. much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. We're great. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Well, we just finished talking to Ren Salazar on Latino Rebels Radio. Um, you are listening. We're almost at the bottom of the hour. This is Julio Ricardo Varela, Julito77 on Twitter. And you can follow us at Latino Rebels. And you can also follow us at... Uh, Facebook on Latino Rebels at latinorebels.com. Uh, we're going to be uh, switching gears going into part three of Al Jazeera's Borderland. We have two cast members coming on very soon. But, Luis, first of all, one, what do you think about Philip? Oh, I, I enjoyed the movie. I wanted to know, I would like to know what his next project because it's. Uh, we'll, we'll bring him back on. But what do you think about what he was saying? I was saying about. Um, how we have to get more serious about storytelling, and you know, it's not just about fantastical or or besos y abrazos all the time. I mean, I thought he was also very critical about certain entertainment that we've been. I, I think he, I think he was being critical. I think he's been critical about some recent movies. I do think we have a, a good tradition of some good documentaries, like the Chicano PBS series. Yeah, that's in a my great opinion, one. is spectacular. It's more about a movement than a person. And what is very nice about his project is starting to look at the tensions at the individual levels of, of figures. I would love for him to t take on some of the other figures of the movement. That would be great. Marcia, in other what, documentaries. Yeah, no, Marcia, what did you get out of it? What did you get out of that? What was your biggest takeaway? Um, yeah, like, like Bruce says, you know, when, once we're starting to talk about the individual, it's away from the Latino movement, Latino, which is they're great, but we're we're at the point where we. I think we lost. I think we're losing Marseille. I think we're losing Marseille. We're gonna put you back. Let's see if we can fix that, Christian. Um, and anyway, before now we're gonna move into Al Jazeera America Borderland. We're gonna bring a couple of cast members, but first, I want to bring uh, another Latina rebel with us. This is Monica. Monica, are you there? We don't have Monica. We're in a little technical. All right, Luis, let's talk. Al Jazeera America's Borderland, part three. Before we bring on two of the cast members, Gary and Randy, what do you think? I was very happy that it focused on the Mexico part of the trek. Uh, what I've been calling the, the middle passage of these Central American migrants, um, looking at La Bestia, looking at the linkages with the with the drug cartels, that we didn't get to see that much about the cartels themselves, but that middle part of the passage is crucial. And I think that in a lot of our debate, we're talking about immigration reform in the United States. And what right. is happening in Mexico should be highlighted much, much more. And what do you, th do you, think, think, that part, do you think that part three did that, or do you think that it, it was just a good start? Because I have my own... Before, before we bring the cast members on, I will bring the cast members of Al Jazeera America's Borderland in a second on Latino Rebels Radio. 
but I wanted to make a couple of points about part three. But you go first, Luis. I, I, th- I think it's a good start. I mean, what can you do in a one-hour show, especially when we get know, I'm, very I'm always... little information about <laughs> that part I always want of the more. trek? I always want more. I mean, here's my thing about, I love, you know, part three, for people that have been watching Al Jazeera America's Borderline or haven't, it is basically what I call the amazing race meets immigration, the immigration debate. Six Americans go back and retrace the lives of, of three migrants that were found dead in the desert, and now they're going back to America, back to the United States, sorry, there's it's all America, they're going back to the United States as if they are migrants. So in this part three, they took a train ride called La Bestia, the Beast, which literally goes through the center of, uh, goes through Mexico, and it brings it all the way up from Central America. But the only thing I had a problem with, Luis, you want to know what I had a problem with? Mm -hmm. What? The The marijuana thing. Like the burning of the marijuana thing. I just didn't get. I uh-huh. didn't get the connection. We're, we, we're going to ask Gary and Randy in a second, but since this is our show, and I am the host, I want to talk about this first before we bring in the guests. But the oh brain my God, one, I was I'm watching like, it. <laughs> I, I, no, but the, the, here's, here's my problem, Lee. Here's my problem with, with, with what it was. I, I, it, here we are as Americans looking at this, right? And I, I mean, I'm glad that they did it, but if if this is all about you know, drugs and marijuana, and we have legal. We have states that are legalizing it. You know, we're both living Definitely. in Massachusetts, and they're, and they're doing marijuana dispensaries. So, you know what I'm You've saying? You've got a point. You've got a point. You've got a point. But that has to be linked. That has to be linked to. And it's funny. My I know. Yeah, the link has to begin thing. first. You're right. You're right. You're right. The link has to begin. So, with that said, with that said, I am actually bringing on two cast members of Al Jazeera America's Borderland. I have Gary and I have Randy. Gentlemen, you both there? Yes, I am we here. are. Thank you. Uh, all right. So um, I want to let the two of you introduce yourself first to our listeners. Um, Gary, why don't you start first with your name and where you're from and and um, and all all that good stuff. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm Gary Larson. I'm a uh, Asparagus grower from Pasco, Washington. I'm here in the southeastern part of Washington State, about 30 miles from the Oregon border. Oh, that's great. And Randy, welcome. Why don't you tell people your name and, and where you're from? Well, thank you. And uh, like Gary, uh, Gary said, I'm uh, glad to be here. My name is Randy Stuffelbeam, and I am a retired Marine, and uh, I'm involved in politics, and which is one of the reasons why I wanted to go down and see part of what's going on. And uh, I live here in Belleville, Illinois. Ooh, uh, all right. Well, thank you. Thank the both of you guys uh, for being on. You'll, you'll have a couple of the Rebels on. Um, I think we're going to be bringing on Rodrigo and Monica and Luis. Uh, but let me, let me start. Let me frame the conversation for the two of you guys first, um, and then we can go from there. Before first, you do you know, that, um, uh, because you mentioned the marijuana thing, I was wondering if oh, you want me to go into the marijuana thing. All right, let's let's talk about the marijuana thing. Go ahead. Yeah, I can answer I that part of that question too. All right, so. go ahead, Gary. Well, go, we'll let Randy go and then cut him off about fifteen minutes in. So. <laughs> All right, go, Randy. Dude, you, you had to go there, right? Well, uh, <laughs> you know the reason why that uh, that that part of it had to be shown is because part of the statistics uh, that came out of our interviews with uh, Sheriff Daniels of Cochise County and uh, Warner uh, uh, Glenn there is that 70% of the uh, border crossings are drug-related. And that, right. and part of the reason is that because what happens is these, uh, these migrants come up, get about halfway up, and run out of money, and they, they don't know what to do, and the drug cartels realize this, and they are more than willing to help them along their way with one condition, that they uh, take in this pot uh, into the United States. So uh, I think it's a very vital part of the story that's being told here. Gary, what do you want to say? Uh, I actually wanted to touch on the fact that since I'm from one of those states that have legalized <laughs> yeah, We're going to go there. <laughs> Anyway, I 
I had brought that up to the to the military guys, and uh, they didn't want to talk about it because their job was still still hadn't changed. It was still to eradicate the pot and the drugs down there. And so as far as they were concerned, that was still a major part of what they were doing. That's, well, I'm glad you guys brought it up. First, I mean, we're going to talk about La Bestia in a second, but it was just an interesting way to end the documentary, like the, today's episode. But, yeah. I, I, Randy, what you're saying, I, you're absolutely right. I think not many people understand the connections of why, you know, part of why. But my, my position about all this, and, you know, as an opinion maker, writer, whatever, is that I think Americans seem to demonize that or stigmatize that that type of world, this drug cartel world, when who's the biggest customer and consumer of drugs for this type of product? But you're absolutely right. And what's interesting is, you know, you mentioned the fact that there are several states in the United States that is legalizing marijuana. So people are going to start growing their own here. And if that happens and if that starts impacting the uh, illegal drugs coming into the United States, or should I say the drugs coming illegally uh, right. into the United States, how is that going to impact this uh, exploitation of the migrants who are trying to make it to, you know, across the border? So that's going to have a real significant impact. Yeah, I think, I think that was a really a interesting of- part of the debate. And uh, Monica and Luis, I want to bring, uh, Monica, I want to bring you in a little bit, or Luis, Monica, what, what what do you have to say about this? Or just I know we're going to talk a little bit about La Bestia and about Randy and Gary in, in a second, but this is the part that really got to me at the end. It was really powerful. And but um, Monica, hi everybody, thanks for having me on today. Hope you all have a nice evening. Um, you know, I just wanted Thank you, Monica. to I just wanted to speak to this point about um, you know gang members giving or drug dealers rather giving migrants a way to make income and, and, and finish their track to the United States. And I was reading something about the, the um, train ride through Mexico, and I was actually kind of astonished by the number of people who have been kidnapped along the way. And one of the right. things that I, I read was that a lot of them are being kidnapped by drug cartels, by drug um, uh, dealers to sell to, you know, take the drugs into the United States and to sell it. So can you speak to that a little bit? Because I, I feel like this impression of you know, Mexican migrants trying to make money by taking drugs over to the United States, that's, that's, that's exactly the kind of stereotype that I think is, is, is uh, spread often. And so, I don't know, could you talk a little bit about what you learned about kidnapping of migrants and forcing them to bring uh, drugs and other things into the U.S.? Uh, uh, you want to, gentlemen. I'll let Gary answer first. Yeah, it's, you know, we were always told about the drugs and the human trafficking. And, and you know, the, both are tragic instances of, of what goes on there in Mexico and, and coming up and doing this trek. Um, you know, I think everybody focuses more on the drug deal, but the human trafficking part of it where people are pulled off the, the train to never be seen right. again uh, is actually more tragic in my eyes. Um, yeah. but, you know, how how do you solve something like that? Uh, because once the drugs cut, get cut off, the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to see more of a, uh increase in the human trafficking and, and basically going in and taking people. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Gary. The only uh, additional aspect of this is that the um, – that there is a desperation to 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 make it across the border, but you know, and and this is probably one of the most horrible parts. I mean, you know, um, the, the statistic that uh, what was it? Eight out of the ten, six to eight of the eight out of ten women get uh, sexually assaulted. Yeah. And, yeah. and they know this. They 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 know they knowingly face this sacrifice to you know, escape the dire circumstances that they find themselves in. And so, you know, the the drug parts is one, but there is just so much exploitation of the plight of the migrants that are trying to leave these dire circumstances and find a better way in the United States. Yeah. All right, Randy, I have to ask you the question because, you know, I'm going to ask you the question. Um, you know, the, the sound bite of – when you're doing your radio show and you say that this is an invasion, right? 
please, you, you said you've been tweeting that you, your heart has been changed because of your journey. Um, can you speak more to how you've gone from you think that this was an invasion? I know, and I know television, so please, I know, I know, you know, they, they'll take a sound bite, and I'm not no, trying no, to paint I, you in a corner. Um, no, but how, how has it transformed you? Yeah, no, Go ahead. That's, that's a good question, and, and I'm not afraid to answer that. Uh, the, the fact is that there is an invasion going on, but it's an invasion that is being driven by the dire circumstances of these migrants in these countries, from Mexico to El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And, and the, the most horrendous part for me as an American and specifically as, a, as a, an American who served 22 and a half years in the Marine Corps is to find out that our country is responsible in part for creating these economic conditions, for creating these violent conditions where we have, you know, deported these uh, migrants back to the country who were members of gangs, and so they're taking these gangs into these countries. We're creating all of this. So we are creating a system whereby there is a, a – we've created this drive of an invasion, and I think, honestly – uh, the, the major change for me is to recognize that, honestly, in my opinion, this really isn't about migration or even immigration. This is more about a refugee problem. People are leaving these countries not to come to America just because they want to be Americans. They're mm. coming because of the dire circumstances that they find themselves in. And I think we have a, a tremendous responsibility to change those circumstances, and then La Bestia will no longer be necessary. Wow, that's that's pretty deep stuff. Gary, What? how does this trip – I know you were someone who was on the other side, you know, like for people that haven't seen and they should be seeing this series. I mean, it's it's actually one of the most uh, powerful series that I've seen um, in a long time. But there was actually three people that, let's just say, were painted as being more against um, people that were, were migrating into this country illegally as opposed to people that said, you know, this is this is something that, you know, it's just it's a bigger issue here. Gary, you're from you. You know, you're a farmer. You came from sort of the people who were saying, like, you know, stereotypes against migrants in in American culture has been something that you know when you hear words like invasion and things. And and Randy's and Randy's answer is is incredible to see that change. How has this changed you, or is it confirmed what you already believed in? I mean, how how how, is, how has the journey shaped you? Well, you know, first off, I, I got to commend Randy. Uh, to come out publicly and with the stuff that he's saying now, because Randy has, I mean, he still believes in uh, full legal immigration, um, but for him to come out and be immersed into this and see the things that's going on and kind of uh, rub elbows with the people that he was once condemning, and for him to come out and and say that it's affected him, I think that's big and. And now he's seen the human the human side of it, so that that's really good for him. Uh, but for myself, you know, I, I've been involved in farming since I was like five years old, and mm-hmm. and what it, what I've noticed is over the years, like when I was younger, you know, we would go to the mission and and get people to come work on the farm, and then someplace along the mid '80s, and it was kind of a, it was always a Hispanic feel that people were coming and getting. And then being involved with the with the, uh, the asparagus, which is a stoop labor type job, I mean that is a job that the Hispanics do just because mainly uh, they are they do this type of work all the time, so they're in condition with it. So I've been involved with this type of thing, she's thirty forty years now. But anyway, how it affected me is when I always thought of immigration, I always just thought of. Uh, Mexico, Mexicans coming into the U.S. and what this has done to me, it, it's opened my eyes and, and it's not just a Mexico versus U.S. problem. It's a Mexico, Central America, South America and you have all these people that have reasons that we cannot understand for wanting to come up and better their lives. And I do have to disagree with Randy just a little bit because he said they come up here and they want to be Americans. Well, that's really not the case. They're coming up to become uh, 
so they could support their families a lot more is what they're trying to do. Yeah, I think uh, I don't think it has anything to do with them wanting to be uh, a United States citizen. Right. Right. Actually, that I, was my point. Uh, yeah, no, that, that, I think I think you guys both agree on that. I think the I think you guys both agree on that. You might have missed that. But the point being is like, this is about, you know, Randy. I I I will commend you. I mean, you know, for what the work that I've done for the last five, four or five years, and painting this in a broad a stroke, and a lot of the stuff that Latino Rebels tries to do is to change perceptions, uh, particularly about Americans who might have a different view. On sort of the migration issue in in um, in this side of the world, and for you to say, you know, for someone like you to say that part of this, you know, you have to, you know, there's a lot of players involved, and the United States government and and other governments are 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 are, are at fault, and and a lot of the policies that you're saying, a lot of things that were created by the U.S. Have have led to these consequences. I just think that's really amazing that you said that on our radio show. Um, considering that I would, when I started watching the the you know episode one, I was probably shaking my my fist at the TV when I saw you, and I'm like, oh, Randy, no. <laughs> so I, I I have to echo what Gary just said. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much. And you know, I I I at least try to uh, take the position that. I will always have my mind open to the truth, and if right. I'm not currently, uh, you know, dealing with the truth, I will, you know, adjust myself accordingly, and that's always been a way I've treated my life. But, um, you know, it, I, I will have to tell you, before going into the show, I was able to have an aloof position on this, where I, you know, I had this almost in an ivory tower. Now, I've never considered myself to be there, but uh, the, the single most important factor, and Gary mentioned this, is the connection to the human factor. And, right. you know, the truth is we are in part responsible for the conditions that are is driving this, and if we don't deal with the truth, we can never resolve the problem. I mean, the, the issue of you know, they're wanting to do amnesty. Well, they've done amnesty once before. That didn't fix the problem. If we don't deal with root causes, we will never fix the problem. Now, Monica, what do you think? Well, I'm just curious. Um, I'd love to hear from both of you. How are you taking this to where you live? How are you um, helping to change people's hearts and minds in, this, in your state? So let's go with Gary first and then and then Randy. Wow. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that you asked that. I mean, uh, other than like my postings and stuff on Facebook and people asking me about it, I haven't done anything intentionally to change anything, but the show is so powerful, it's speaking for all of us. Mm. Um, you know, I've I've had, there's there's one individual and, and he told me that, you know, he's pretty much set in the ways and he wasn't going to watch the show, and lo and behold, he started watching the show. And he he's, says that, uh, you know, he really likes the show. It's opened his eyes some, and he wants to hear all of my opinions when it's all over and done with. Um, but for the most part, you know, the this show, like I said, it's so powerful, and it's, it's doing the talking for us. You know, the biggest problem that I see with it is that, it doesn't have the viewership that it needs to have. This needs to be up to 6 million people a night watching this to really make a huge impact rather than this uh, grassroots sort of thing mm. that's going on now. Yeah. Randy, what, what, do you, what, do you, what are you doing to, to answer Monica's, Monica's question? What have you done? I know you said you, you were talking to a, a group yesterday. I think I saw a tweet from yeah. you. Well, let me first say that you know, a, a part of that change, and, and and I commend Gary, and I absolutely agree with him about the perspective of this show is probably the single most important show out there to dialogue because it doesn't just say, hey, you need to think this way or that way. It exposes the length and breadth of the, the condition and the situation and the opinions, and I think that really is a way to start engaging people because – Everybody can have a point of reference from where to begin this conversation. And um, Gary has been a, a tremendous impact. Oh, well, I don't know if I, I would say as as totally impactive as the overall perspective, but Gary 
himself has had a significant impact on changing, you know, my perspective of the, the situation and, and, and conditions. Uh, j- just specifically because of what he has to deal with. And so, you know, for that I'm tremendously grateful. Uh, but I didn't go on this um, on this, uh, this journey with Al Jazeera America just to have a vacation and just have to have a hoopla. I had a purpose and a mindset because we have such a tremendous thing, and I've never seen the border up close and personal. I've never been across the border. I've never seen these things. And so I know I needed an informed uh, an informed position from which to start the, the, the dialogue. And like I said, yesterday I presented a uh, – well, it was supposed to be 30 minutes, but I made it into about 47 minutes because I just couldn't stop. I showed over 4,000 pictures myself. I yeah. kept a personal journal that I can't uh, publish yet until after the, the show completely airs, and I have a website where all of this information is going to be there. I took about 100 of those 4,000 pictures and made a presentation pe- to people, and, of which I thought I was going to get some pretty big flack, but... That they were moved. They said, I didn't know. And, and, and some of mm. these people even lived fairly in Nevada, fairly close to the border, like, I didn't know. And you give a compelling uh, – uh, and the thing is, they can't just say, Randy, that's your opinion. I've got the pictures to prove it. And so <laughs> my mission is to change the dialogue here. That's great. Yeah. Well, I yeah. want to thank both Gary Larson and Randy Stubblebeam, uh, cast members of Al Jazeera America's Borderland, the final episode will be next Sunday night on Al Jazeera America at 9 o'clock Eastern. And then you guys are doing a reunion show the week after, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Hey, I, I would like to also add, too, you know, the uh, I've been approached by some of the, the local schools and stuff to also speak on this issue that's uh, great. to some of the classes. So that's, that's pretty good, I think. That's awesome. So I want to thank you guys on behalf of the Latino Rebels for coming on. And we're going to try to get everyone else on one last, last time before, because we, we really are big fans of the show, and we love the discussion, and we're glad that the, the debate's talking, and, and um, it's, it's been fantastic. So good luck with the rest of the show, and we'll try to get you guys back on, okay? All right. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for having me. All right. Take it easy. Thanks so Bye-bye. much. Bye. Thank you. All right, so that was uh, Randy and Gary. Monica, what did you think about that? What did you think? I, you know, I felt like they made some pretty pretty important statements, and I think they're right. I think a lot more people need to see the show, and I think that um, I, we just need to get that message out to people that there is a root cause to this immigration problem that needs to be dealt with and that we need to take some responsibility in, in, in resolving the issue. So I thought I thought it was terrific to hear from them, and I'd love to hear more from them. Now we'll get him back. Um, we got, you know, we got a couple minutes left. It's Latino Rebels Radio. This is who we were Ricardo Varela with Monica Ramirez, and we're bringing in Rodrigo and Luis back to kind of wrap up the show and see what their impressions and thoughts about both the topics tonight, both Ruben Salazar, Man in the Middle, and Al Jazeera America's Borderland. So, Rodrigo, you, you know, you're like the wise sage that comes in at the end of the show. So I want I want to give you give you the opportunity to sh- to share your thoughts about what you heard. Um, I just think um, overall that um, it's it's good to finally see people who are being critics of the issues going on in the uh, in the southern border um, make it make it make it seem more more real that it's not just uh, all these myths that have been going out for years and years. Uh, it's it's good to see that, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I also, you know, um, I also I think the, the the best description that I've been to describe it, that people have been telling me the issue of describing it is more like a uh, uh, what is it a uh, economic refugee? Is yeah. It, is, is yeah, it no, it's amazing. You know, Randy Stolbeam is perhaps, um, I would say, on in terms of conservative views on this was pretty extreme starting at the beginning of the show and to have a former Marine who has a constitutional patriotic American show say, Oh, the United States was part of the problem as well. I mean, that was pretty intense. I mean, yeah, I think there's there's some good in having this conversation and having this experience, but, 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 
thing that always gets me is always like we, we think about the immigration issue as just the uh, Latin America, uh, Central America, and Mexico yeah. Mexico issue. When we have a northern border that's not even monitor at all. So I mean, what are what are we really trying to say? And I think you know that's that, that hopefully that those those ideals will be talked about at some other forum. Uh, and then hopefully everything else, you know, would, you know, will we'll lead to that discussion at one point. But I just think that, you know, we, we talk too much about what, um, what, what is being broadcast out there, not what sometimes is the reality of it. Right. So, Luis, what no, thoughts? It's, 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 yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Luis, what thoughts do you have? Well, I would really like to see to hear what Randy is going to be continuing doing. And right. I am very interested in seeing what are those root causes he was talking about. Is it just at the level of government policy? Is he talking about our patterns of consumption? Is he talking what what's our role in that human trafficking? What's our role in mm-hmm. that unfair trade of avocados, of illegally mined gold in all these I think you have a class, I think you have a class for next next semester, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> No, you can, I mean, you can, you can ask Randy and Gary to six. Yeah, you can bring okay. him on as a guest. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that, that's always good. So um, this is the way I like to end the show every every week and go around the round table here. Monica, what 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 stories are you are you paying attention to this week? You know, this week I, I'm focusing on um, what the the guidance is going to be around using the deportation. You know, I, we've we've been hearing mm-hmm. about that, we've been hearing, reading stories about that, but I, I want some more details. So I'm hoping we'll get some more this week. Great, Rodrigo. Um, following the uh, Donald Sterling uh, news, also following um, uh, more. What will be a good discussion uh, once the uh, documentary is aired on Tuesday regarding uh, Ruben Salazar, also uh, following a lot of uh, indigenous uh, land issues that are happening in, in, in the Amazon and Latin America right now, and um, just, just trying to keep that all in together. So, Great. And Luis? Oh, I'm following this week the Middle East, what's going on with this impasse between the Israelis and Palestinians, and some interesting developments in Iran, some very interesting declarations and a meeting between Saudis and Iranians. And you know that that's another part of the world I'm very interested in. Oh, yes, you mm-hmm. are. Yes, you mm-hmm. are. Well, I, this is Latino Rebels Radio. We had a really wonderful discussion tonight. LatinoRebels.com. You can tweet us at, at Latino Rebels. This is Julio Ricardo Varela, Julito 77. And as I tell my producer, Christian, to close out with La Plebe, Venas Abiertas, play it out, Latino Rebels Radio, every Sunday night, live, 10 p.m. at night. Have a good night. We'll see you next week. Salud. Adios. Rebeldes. No pueden más